Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started here very shortly. Just going to wait for Roger to sit down. All right, we're going to get started. Um, we've been instructed that uh, anybody who's speaking up here, feel free to move this around as much as you want. Uh, it's totally OK. You're not going to kill anything, break anything. Uh, my name is James McGregor. I'm Associate Director of Strategic Projects and Services with Public Knowledge Project. Uh, and I'm here today to introduce our Views from Researchers panel. Uh, this is a, a cool opportunity for me because I think Juan and I, we've been talking yesterday about how as a, sort of as a group, PKP, and even as a conference, we spend so much time talking about infrastructure, uh, development, custom development, uh, client support, editorial issues, things like that, we actually overlook one of the larger components of the, uh, the overall PKP mandate, which is research. So uh, I'm really excited to be able to introduce today our three panelists, uh, Juan Pablo Alperin, Susan Brown, and Cameron Naim. Uh, we'll be having them come up one at a time uh, to give their uh, presentation, each taking about 15 minutes, and then we'll have some questions uh, towards the end. So first up, we have Juan Pablo Alperin, uh, who is the Assistant Professor in Publishing Studies at Simon Fraser University and uh, Associate Faculty Director of Research. Uh, also a longtime PKP uh, collaborator for probably since 10 years? There we go, long time, long time. Uh, and a former developer, I think. Yeah, yeah. thanks Juan. Thank you, James. There was a long conversation yesterday about my ex developer status. I was stripped of my developer status when I tried to put it on a bio a few years ago by Alec, who said that I, haven't, I hadn't contributed a line of code in a long time, so I had to stop putting it on my bio. But it was, you know, that's, it's where I came up. It's my roots. I probably this is the last time I'll be on the stage. I know this is the third time that you've had me up here, uh, and so uh, this will be the last one. Um, here we go. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, even as, as James was sort of alluding to, Yesterday, we were sort of going around and like, what is each person on the team sort of doing? And then James turned and said to me, and you, uh, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and so it's because most of my time now is actually spent doing research since in the last three years I've been an assistant professor. Uh, and I've been working on uh, doing some kind of research almost since the beginning with PKP when I started running surveys of journals in Latin America. But now that since I did my PhD and then I started become, I became a professor at, S at SFU three years ago, um, I've been sort of really been working on different um, kinds of research activities, some of which are, as I presented a little bit a few minutes ago, uh, directly tied to PKP, but for the most part, they're just tied to scholarly communications. And broadly, um, as I started with my dissertation, and now I've carried into my research agenda, very interested in looking at different ways of looking at the public's use of research. So it's research that's very much in line with the mission of PKP, of, of this idea of public knowledge, and actually trying to see if we can find different ways of uh, of measuring it, of identifying it, of, of, being in, of in some way being able to show the value that the public finds in having access to research. And so very recently, uh, as part of, as I started sort of working on more and more different research projects, I uh, decided to sort of launch what I've called the Scholarly Communications Lab. Uh, and it's something that I've, uh, been, I've, I've been uh, now co-directing with Stephanie Haustein, who's now at the University of Ottawa as of this fall. Uh, and the two of us have been collaborating on a project for a couple of years, and we realized actually we're sort of very, we work really well together, and we decided that we wanted to try to uh, sort of group together all of our activities into one place. And what I'm going to do over the next uh, 13 minutes is just give you a very quick overview of uh, some of the papers that we have in the pipeline, or either that we just published or that we are somewhere on the, on the way to having out there. So this is a little bit of a sneak peek of the kind of broad range of things that, uh, that we're working on at the Skullcom Lab. First, uh, some of the people that are part of this, uh, we've got some research associates, uh, including uh, Vincent Larivere, Catherine Riley, who are two um, uh, professors. Uh, Vincent is here at the University of Montreal. Catherine is with me at SFU. And then three postdocs that have different ranges of being uh, part-time, uh, uh, like, so between half-time or, or quarter-time uh, with the lab that are physically located in, in Vancouver and even have a visiting uh, faculty, Germana Barata. Uh, now I have some students. I have now two PhD students, uh, and uh, one of them is remote in Argentina that I'm just co-supervising, and Asura will be starting uh, with us in the fall, uh, as well as a, a, a master's uh, student from the communications program, and two students that are uh, now we've 
I guess, been around long enough. I've been three years where I can now have past students. So I wanted to also highlight that the two, two past uh, associate students that were, have been research assistants and have been working on things. We just did our first course this week. And if you were here on the first day of the sprint, you might have seen me out on the lawn outside of the bar at 4 o'clock when the course that we were teaching at the Force 11 Scholarly Communication Summer Institute was having technical problems. And the course that I had set up all of the things up online to work was starting. They were like, well, none of us can connect. So I had to sit out on the lawn and make sure that that was running smoothly. But we just ran our first course, Stephanie and I, together. And then I'm just going to run through some of the themes of what we're doing. So one of them is studying different issues around open access. In some way, everything we do ties into that. It's all work that is helping to try to um, help um, people that are trying to do advocacy have the right evidence to be able to argue uh, or to be able to show the value of open access. We just published this preprint this week uh, where we're showing the state of open access. This is together with, uh, it's really the, the, uh, the work of Heather Pewar and Jason Prem and their OA, DOI, and on paywall, showing that the proportion of articles that are available in open access uh, has been growing, reaching about 45% of the literature in uh, 2015. Some very interesting findings, if you want to go to the preprint, around the, the bronze OA, the new category sort of that we coined, which is things that are freely available on the publisher's website, but is not necessarily have a, has an open license attached to it. So we don't know its status is somewhat precarious. So using some uh, pretty interesting sort of quantitative methods and services to be able to gather this data on a very large scale uh, to try to provide some evidence and some understanding of what actually is going on in open access. Um, I started because uh, John had asked me to close a discursive loop in my dissertation, so I, he said, well, you need to talk to the people that you looked at with your altmetrics in your dissertation, you need to tell me who they are. And so instead of actually going through and looking through all of those accounts, I, uh, being a computer scientist, uh, did, uh, wrote some Twitter bots. And so I did some Twitter bot surveys developing a new methodology that, um, around how do we poll people that are on social media. And so wrote a little bot that would ask people questions about what they were, uh, whether they were affiliated with a university. I wanted to know if they were a member of the public or an academic. I did this, this is part of my dissertation work. I did it, you know, I polled about 6,000 people that were still active, and I had a 5% response rate. Okay, so not so great. Uh, it's still in my dissertation with a 5% response rate, but it, was, it led to some really interesting things that where we could see the kinds of people that were sharing research, right? People that were saying, uh, you know, part of the National Institutes of Health of Mexico, she had shared an article that was published in Cielo. Uh, someone that says, I'm doing research on, uh, on paleontology, uh, but at the moment I'm not associated with any, any university, I work with a museum, right? Uh, someone saying, I produce a weekly science communication podcast, right? So this started to tell me there's something in looking at social media as a way of being able to find, find the public, right? So, and some of my other of my favorites, right? Someone part of an association of people affected with, I think it was Crohn's disease, right? Uh, this person said, sure, you can ask me if I am affiliated or not. I, I'm a restaurant owner, right? So, so it's, you know, shared some research uh, and not at all affiliated with an academic or a research institution. And this one of my favorites is someone who's a solo technologist who says, I, I, you know, I, I find things, I'm looking for information just to enhance my understanding, I'm currently unemployed. Right? People that are really making use of research. So this led me to wanting to look at social media a little bit more closely as a nice way to find where the public is able to find value in research. But, you know, there was that 5% response rate, maybe not so encouraging. And so then one of the work that we did is to actually do an experiment on how can we try to improve that response rate. So ask the question in a bunch of different ways, right? Uh, we sort of tested out, we looked at the survey literature and find that, you know, different kinds of questions, open-ended, yes, no, or multiple choice questions. Uh, the egoistic appeal, you've seen this if you've ever been asked to do a survey, like you've been selected, right? Or, you know, and then you get asked to answer the questions. This is known in the survey literature to enhance response rates, so we tested that. Providing more or less context, in the case of Twitter, we did that as a reply or as a mention. And what we found is actually quite a bit of variety in the response rates. And when you ask the question in all the right ways, multiple choice questions with the egoistic appeal, sort of saying to them, you recently shared an article, like we're targeting you in particular, and you do it as a reply to their tweets, we got response rates going up to about 40%. Right? And so this is part of uh, uh, sort of saying, okay, now we have a methodology that we can actually employ to learn what people are doing on social media. 
As we were running that experiment and writing it up, I just presented that last week at the Social Media and Society Conference. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to look at is uh, what else, so we, you know, this focused me on social media, and so we started looking at networks on social media. And so we just grabbed, and again, this is just pilot kind of studies, 11 articles from Biomed Central, uh, Biology and Evolutionary Biology that had more than 50 tweets in 2015. Uh, so we grabbed those 11 articles uh, and then started mapping the Twitter following networks. Actually, most networks that we're finding of people that have shared a paper look like this. It's a big blob of people that are already connected to one another, right? And so this sort of gives, uh, puts a bit of a, um, it breaks down a little bit this idea that social media is a place where you reach a broader public. Actually, it turns out most networks we look at are pretty, like, tightly connected. But we do find some networks where we find here, you can kind of clearly see two communities. The lighter color means they tweeted first, and the darker colors means they tweeted later. So here what we actually find is actually mostly an English language community around this paper, and a, and a community of Japanese speakers, a larger blob on the, on the left. And the tweets also reflect that, that language use. So we start finding, okay, here's academic communities, but we're finding two different ones. And then even in those 11 papers, we find a network that looks completely different to those. Right? So here's a paper that had to do with dieting and sugar and a link to cancer. Right? Very different kind of network structure when you look at who are the, the social network of, of who shared it on Twitter. If you focus in, here you find kind of like the academic community. They, they're still always the earliest tweeters. But then we find people at the bottom, nutrition experts, authors, people that have PhDs, but that are writing popular science uh, sort of books or dieting books and nutrition and fitness authors, right? So reach a very different kind of, uh, reach a very different kind of, of public. Um, we're starting to do this on a larger scale now. We grabbed all of the communication journals and we're mapping their networks. These are just, it's just a pretty picture of a bunch of uh, scatter plots of mapping different network indicators to try to understand the relationship between the different network indicators to see can we try to detect when we get a network that looks like this, right? Can we try to detect networks like this by just looking at the network property. So we don't actually have to visualize it, we can actually just try to find them quantitatively. Right? I'm trying to look for those relationships. This is just very much ongoing work, there's nothing concrete to report yet, but just to, to say that we're trying to, you know, that was 11 articles, now we're doing it with, with uh, 4,000 articles. Another thing we're looking at, again, focused on social media, is looking at a little bit of some different aspects of culture on social media. So with Germana, um, we're doing, uh, we grabbed all of the papers that had Zika in the title, uh, published in the first six months of 2016, right? It turned out there were 718 articles, some 46,000 tweets, and 2,500 Facebook posts. We grabbed all of those articles, and we started to look at what's the language breakdown on the different platforms? Who are the people that are, what, what languages are they speaking about Zika, right? Zika is a, we pick Zika because it's, um, it was a sort of went to global attention, but it actually affected mostly people in, uh, in, in non-English speaking countries. And so we were kind of curious, find very large differences between the languages that people talk about research on Twitter. It's almost exclusively English, over 90%. On Facebook, we see a lot of other languages being used, right? Still dominated by English, but the difference between 76% and 90%, this one, this paper, we're also sort of in the uh, midst of finishing it. There's some statistically significant differences. And you can actually see how this breaks down depending on the language of the authors. One of the things we were interested in looking at was whether or not authors from, let's say, from Brazil were trying to target, were, were, uh, targeting issues or topics that were more relevant in Brazil, and maybe those were being talked about in Portuguese more so than, than in English. And again, we find you know, the differences play out by, um, by language. Twitter is pretty much, you get the same thing kind of across the board, that 90% English and then a breakdown. But on Facebook, we see kind of the local organization effect that Twitter allows for smaller targeted communications where you can say, I'm intending, I know my audience is Portuguese speaking. And so when you see the papers written by uh, Brazilian authors, with at least one Brazilian author, you see that 14% of the t uh, Facebook posts about those papers are in Portuguese. So we start getting these differences around different authors are clearly, their work is being talked about um, in different places, right? Or, or, or trying to look at different audiences. So again, trying to figure out how can we understand which, where is the non-academic public, right? It might not be on Twitter. And we might find it a lot more on Facebook. At least this is what the language, looking at language would lead us to, uh, to believe. We've got another survey looking, well, this is just, we don't really have any preliminary results yet. We haven't actually launched a survey, but we're doing a survey looking at how are academics using social media to communicate? Are they actually trying? What social media are they using? Where are they trying to target? Again, so now trying to understand from both sides, not just who's sharing the research, but what are the academics themselves trying to do? So we've, uh, this is the work that Germana is, uh, is again leading. 
Um, and then looking at sort of uh, culture in other ways outside of academia. Um, I've always hear about that the reason that we don't have more open access is because the incentive structures are wrong and that professors are mostly encouraged to publish only in high prestige journals and that it's the impact factor that's meaning that's the reason why academics are not motivated to work on open access. And so there was a proposal to try to change review tenure and promotion. I was hearing people talk about a project to change review tenure and promotion that was citing a whole bunch of uh, anecdotal evidence about that this was the case. Uh, and so we decided, well, you know, we have computational skills and we have uh, qualitative uh, skills in our lab. Why don't we actually try to assess what is going on in these review tenure and promotion guidelines? We're collecting hundreds of um, uh, review tenure and promotion guidelines, both at the institution level and at the department level. And we're starting to now do the content analysis with both machine uh, reading of the documents and with a close qualitative reading of the documents. This is also very much preliminary. I've got a preliminary report from Carol, who's doing the qualitative work. Uh, just one of the graph, one of the tables that I have so far looking at uh, the mention of metrics in these documents. So we're trying to get a breakdown. Is it research institutions that are talking more about metrics, or is it baccalaureate or ma master sort of level institutions that are more worried about metrics? So we've got this representative stratified sample from across different institution types in North America, uh, Canada, and the, and the US. And we're starting to look for different things like uh, how they talk about quality, how they talk about peer review, do they talk about public engagement? And so we can kind of mine out all of these words from the documents to see if it's present, and then we can look with qualitative, more detailed reading and coding, we can see the, some of the, the relationships and what are the ways in which faculty are being encouraged or discouraged from trying to be uh, more, more open. And then, of course, there's the research about the OJS stats, but that I already had 10 minutes to, or four minutes to talk about. It was probably more like seven minutes that I used to talk about it, so I won't go into that. It was mostly just, it's just so that it, John is always asking me for the, for the number, and so I make sure that I keep this as a core part of the research agenda uh, so that uh, I can always pull out the number right as he's needing to say it. Um, so that's it. That's a little bit the fast-paced, like broad-ranging stuff that we're working on. Um, I'd be happy to answer some questions or tell you a little bit more detail. Um, and then we have a mailing list. You can look, sign up from the bottom of our, our website or just reach out to me on Twitter to, uh, to see when these things are actually out with all of their details and spoken or, or spoken at a uh, more reasonable pace. Thanks.